Okay, so well, thank you very much for the invitation to to talk at this conference. Actually, and I may used to talk to the people at Daisy as uh, I'm essentially a physicist who wants to understand Feynman, inte Feynman integrals. But uh, what I want to explain in this talk is some approach that we are following with Spencer Block and Matt Kerr on how to try to understand the nature of these Feynman integrals, in a sense, deriving the differential equation they satisfy, evaluating them, understanding the function to which they evaluate, using various tools, uh, including uh, motives, and uh, what we discovered actually in that paper is that actually there's some nice application of mirror symmetry uh, that we can find in a class of n man integral that I will describe in that talk. So actually, in this talk, I will first start slowly from the motivation of why I'm studying that problem, I mean, where I come from as a physicist, and I will start building uh, slowly toward more mathematical and more abstract notions. So essentially for what, what we want to do in, in, in physics and quantum field theory, so we want to compute scattering amplitude. So the scattering amplitude are essentially the object you want to, to compute if you want to understand, for example, the, the physics of the Higgs. You, want, you can use scattering amplitude to compute various classical and quantum gravity effects. So it's an essential tool that physicists use in order to, to connect our model to reality. And there are, in this talk, I will essentially be talking about quantum field theory, but there is as well scattering amplitude in string theory. And, uh, so, and so, in general, what we use in, in, in physics these days is that this is the amplitude you want to compute. And um, you want, we essentially understood that it's, it's pretty generic to try to expa expand any scattering amplitude on here, yeah, what I call a basis of integrals with some coefficient. And depending whether you do QED, QCD, gravity, if you, at a given order in perturbation, know your basis of master integrals, the difference between the various theories come into the coefficient that are here. So in a sense, essentially the problem that uh, today, uh, the way we approach, one approach to to quantum field theory and computation of scattering amplitude is to understand at a given loop order, so one loop, two loops, three loops, what are the, what we call the master integrals, what kind of object we have here, and then uh, you just then understand, doesn't work, oh, yes, then you understand, then you, you understand what, what are the coefficients on that basis of integrals depending on the physical phenomena you want to study. So my talk will be concerned about understanding these, uh, these integrals and actually trying to do as much as possible without computing them and using uh, mathematical notions and, uh, to, to tell you what, is this, what are these master integrals. So Feynman integrals generally are objects like that. So at L loop, Feynman integrals in D dimension so you integrate over a vector, I mean, a d-dimensional vector, you have L of them. And typically you have here propagators, these propagators are quadratic forms, and they can be raised, so the standard Feynman rules generally gives you this propagator raised to the power one, but when you want to look at the, the master of, the master integrals, you, you are led naturally to consider higher powers of propagators, so here you can have nu i that is an integer, positive integer. So th this form is not very, uh, I mean, it, it's not very practical for what I'm going to say, so uh, I'm going, I'm switching to, I'm sorry, so this thing, I'm switching to this so-called parametric form, where I, you introduce as many parameters as that are conjugated to your propagators, and you get an object 
this is a total equivalence, that tells you that the same integral is given by a ratio of, so there is a polynomial that u and v are Zimanzig polynomial that are homogeneous in, in, in your n variables, n is the number of propagators, u is of homogeneous of degree l, l is the loop order, v is homogeneous of degree l plus one, and you see here u is multiplied by something of degree one, so homogeneity works here, and the sum of the indices is what I call new here, the loop order is here, the dimension of space-time is here, okay. So actually this formula looks like a very, so, and this is, here you have a rational function of your physical parameters. So here are the masses that you have inside the loop and you can have external momenta and V, I'm going to explain to you. And, and the prescription is that you integrate over this cycle that is all positive, exact, positive quadrant. So in a sense, I mean, you know, generally Feynman integrals diverge, they have infrared or UV divergences, but no, you know, so one way to treat the divergence is to, to, to analytic continue in D. So you see D, the loop, are no parameters. Yeah, you can do some nice expansion. Well, that is going to be tricky. No, can I do it? It works? Yes, okay. Okay, so what are these U and V polynomial? So, in a sense, I mean, there are, there are many ways to, to describe them, but one way I like is to think that the U polynomial is, so suppose you have a two-loop graph, it's a vacuum graph with no legs attached. So you have naturally a homology, you have two cycles. So as a string theorist, the natural thing I want to write is a period matrix. And for all these graphs, it is free loop, there are two topologies here at free loop, so you can naturally write something that is the integral over the cycles of vector that you define on, on your graph. So then you define a matrix omega. So if you do it this way, you will get for this two loop an object that is symmetric, like that. For this one, you get something that has some zero here. And this one, the Mercedes, has no, no zero anywhere. And the Zimanzig polynomial is, exa is exactly the determinant of that. So for the people who are more prefer a string theory uh, language, I mean, it's really what you get when you degenerate the, 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 the genus two, genus three Riemann surface. You have to tell exactly how you pinch the various cycle and you follow what phase is telling you in his book. Okay. The other piece of my uh, parametric representation is V over U. V over U actually is exactly uh, the thing that knows about the external state. So. Here I had the external momenta, I suppose, oh, this is P, this is K, sorry. <laughs> uh, and, but, so this is an object that is quadratic in the, in the scalar product of the P, so this is PK, you can have the, the self product as well if you want. And here you have a green function that connects two points. On, yeah, I just wrote it uh, on the circle, so here you have just the, the natural green function. Again, if you use the, 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 the natural green function you have on a genus one Riemann surface between two punctures, this is what you get by the degeneration limit. And if you have, I know you can do it if you want, if you have a state here, a state here, a two loop, you, you get as well the green function this way. So these objects are very, very natural objects that you build out of the topology of the graph, okay? So essentially, what, I'm, what, what, what I want to tell you is that by this graph polynomial that I call phi gamma, that is the, the product of the Zimanzig polynomial, so this has to do with the vacuum graph, the thing that knows about the internal masses, so the MI would be the masses between here yeah, on, the, on the various yeah, inside, on the internal legs, and V knows about the external state or the punctures if you want, if I know this, I can, of course, completely recover U and V. I mean, it's, you just have to look for the term linear in the masses, and you, you, I, mean, you, you, I can get what is U, and then I can guess what is V. Okay. So from a, a, an homogeneous polynomial of certain degree, from the number of variables, I know the number of propagators. From the degree, I know the loop order, because the loop order is the degree minus one. And from the LR characteristic of the graph, I know the number of vertices is one plus N minus L. So, if you give me an homogeneous polynomial of certain degree, I can tell you if it can correspond to a Feynman graph. 
Okay. So suppose I take a more general quadric in P2. So here I have something that, uh, that is, uh, uh, I have three variables, x1, x2, x3, but it's homogeneous. Uh, it's in P2 because normally, I mean, as I, yeah, this has to do with the fact that normally one variable I can set to one, but I decide to write it this way. It is of degree two. So I want to see what are the conditions and the coefficients so that it corresponds to a Feynman graph. So if you do the little exercise, you realize that there is only one solution that is a triangle graph. So it's only for the precise identification of the coefficient here that are related to what I call the internal masses, that will be the mass of, uh, the, mass of the propagators here, and here the, the, the mass square of the propagators here, that you have that this guy is associated is a graph polynomial. Okay? So in a sense, not all homogeneous polynomials are associated to a graph polynomial, but graph polynomial are homogeneous polynomial. So if I now look at a cubic, then I do the same and I find this guy that is no, uh, again, the, the linear part, I still have three propagators, three masses. I have exactly the two loop uh, determinant that I showed you. And here there is only one kinematic variable, like k square or p square, that is multiplied by that. And this is the only solution I can find here. So, and this is the, what I call the sunset or the two loop sunset if I want to make sure about the two loop order. And in general, if I want to look at a uh, homogeneous polynomial of degree in, in Pn, I find that the only solution are the so-called n-loop sunset graph, which is just given by this homogeneous polynomial. Okay? So in general, when I have over cap of graph, double box, for example, that are of two-loop double box that are of very special interest for uh, the x physics, uh, you, the, 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 the polynomial looks different. But here, yeah, what I want to do is that I want to study that family. I want to study actually the Feynman integrals that are associated with that family of graph. So what I want to do now is that, so I want to, to study that integral seeing no this way. I have a top form, so I write it a more general way. For the graph that I just mentioned, all this uh, sunset graph in two dimensions, it turns that the sum of the news is equal to L plus one, so there is no numerator, and this is the, the power is one, and there is no power, so you will see in a moment. But anyway, in general, any Feynman graph, what I'm going to say is very general, so any Feynman integrals in this representation, you have a top form, and it is sitting in, a, in there, so it is sitting in the, in the cohomology, where that is on the complement on the hypersurface defined by the graph polynomial. Okay? And then I'm integrating over this positive quadrant. Yeah. So the problem is that uh, you see this guy, well, I mean, the problem is that the, the, my domain of integration intersects uh, my graph polynomial. And this guy has boundaries, actually normal crossing given by this normal crossing divisor. So in a sense, I mean, it's not a proper uh, period integral, okay? So I want to see that uh, normally a period integral where I'm integrating a top form on a cycle. So if you want, I mean, uh, to make contact with what was said in the previous talk, and I will, I will mention that as well for the case of the elliptic curve, you can write this thing as a residue. So you can write, if you want, you can push things I mean, essentially, the singularity is at most logarithmic. It doesn't work. But anyway, so, so essentially what happens is that you can write this thing as, a, if you prefer, as a residue form evaluated on, the, on x gamma, the, 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 uh, and, and then you integrate over a cycle in the homology. So, so what, because of that, what, I'm, what I want in that language is to look at something that is a relative cohomology setup where I want to avoid the place where my graph polynomial intersects with my domain of integration. So for the sunset, I was telling you, and I will be more uh, precise, uh, explicit in a moment, the graph polynomial defines an elliptic curve, and the elliptic curve goes exactly through the, the, just the, the corner of the, the triangle of my domain of integration, so I just blow it up by putting P1s and, and now I'm going to look at my integral as a period integral for this 
cohomology, where I just do the appropriate uh, blow up. And, and okay. So as I mentioned before, the Feynman integral tend to have ultraviolet and UV divergences. But in, that, in the expression that I give here, that I give here, the, I, can, I can work if my integral has divergences, it's not finite. If it has divergences in four dimensions, for example, I can do an expansion, I can take d to, to be four minus two epsilon and do an epsilon expansion. And then when you do that, of course you get, you get, décidément, okay, doesn't work, you know. So you get poles, you get poles, and then you get, of course, and, and, and the expansion doesn't stop. So even when it is finite, it's interesting to study what is the epsilon expansion in that context. And the CI are still period integrals in the sense of the one that was studied in this, in this work. I mean, and in particular, uh, they fit the definition of Kontsevich and Zagier. So now, the, the question for me, which is to understand uh, the master's integrals that are needed for evaluating my amplitude, scattering amplitude in quantum field theory, is just a question of understanding what are the periods of my motive. So this is my motive. And, of course, um, quantum field theory is not just at fixed value, so I will vary the energy that I'm of the incoming and outgoing particle. So in particular, here, I want to vary the value of p square, keeping the mass mi. So we'll have a family of, oops, I'm sorry, yes. So what's, what's going on? I mean, okay, yes, I see. Okay, very good. Okay, so I see. So I will have a family of, uh, of, uh, of actually Hodge structure. And then, uh, so that means I will have to look at variation of Hodge structure. And, and so this is where, by understanding the variation of the Hodge structure, and in particular looking at the Gossman in, co the Gossman in connection, I will be able to, to derive the Picard Fuchs equation. And a generic fact about the, all the Feynman integrals is that there is an inhomogeneous terms. So in a sense, there is always an extension that you have to deal with, and the extension can be complicated or not, depending on the setup, and I will describe that. So in a sense, to make contact with the previous talk about uh, why it was man uh, the riemann hilbert problem was mentioned, yeah, I made a little, uh, a little list. So the, these items are what are the mathematical questions, and this is what they correspond in quantum field phase. So I put this little graph. So compute the, I mean, the period. So you have no setup. I want to compute the period. I want to know what are the period of my motives. So essentially, this is what we want to do in, 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 in quantum field theory. We want to evaluate them numerically efficiently. We want to know what kind of function they are. So we want to understand the local monodromy. And actually, the problem of the local monodromy is exactly the one that you have when you look at unitarity, when you look at the discontinuities of the, your scattering amplitude and particle production. It's, it, it's not just words. I mean, it's really, it's really the same. Then you want to construct a complex system of differential operators. So the, the a very, very common method, um, popular method in quantum field theory is what's so-called integration by part identity that is used in QCD, and which essentially is a way to build the gauss in connection. But I want to use a different method to, to build that because it's not very practical in a lot of cases, but you can construct the Picard-Fuchs operator in a way I will describe in a minute. I'm sorry. And then, what are the special functions you need? So in particular, this is where the motivic approach tells you whether you know what kind of obstruction of being polylog, multiple polylog, elliptic polylog, or, I mean, obstruction or not, I mean, so. Okay, so let me look at the sunset family. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to look at this family, special family of graphs, when p, where the masses here are fixed and p square is varying. So as I was tell, as I, as I will tell you, I mean, actually, that leads to an interesting family of motifs that is not mixed state and has a lot of non-trivial extension. And then we will discover mirror symmetry at some point in it. So 
if you want, I mean, if you write it this in this little factorized way, little phi, what characterizes the graph is this uh, homogeneous polynomial here. And this guy has a reflexive Newton polynomial. His polar part has only integer point. And actually, it's Fano. So essentially, all the sunset family is a one parameter family of Calabio hypersurface in, in of Fano type. So let me now look at the, the let me start with the first non trivial case, which is the, the genus 2 case. The genus 2 case, my cubic defines an elliptic curve. Okay, so you want to compute this over this domain of integration that is positive x. So of course I can write it, and this is the way actually we write it in the papers with Spencer and Matt, as a residue, evaluate, uh, you take the residue of that guy, evaluate it on the elliptic curve, and you push it to H1. But anyway, I prefer to write it this way in this talk. So in general, the elliptic, when, when the, the, the value of the masses are different here, this is an open elliptic curve. When all the masses are the same, it's, it's actually uh, a nice modular curve, x16. That is in the Beauville classification. So already you see something nice. So what I want to do is that I want to derive the picard fuchs operator. So instead of having a differential operator to which I want to find a period, I, I want to avoid actually uh, GZK. So I, I know that I have a period that is given to me by physics. A natural period is the period where I integrate the same object, but I, but I change the domain of integration. I integrate over the torus. Why do I do that? Because this is exactly what uh, the maximal cut, the discount, this is what unitarity tells you in, string, uh, in quantum field theory. So you cut all the lines, you re, you, and you compute that integral with delta functions. That means you have replaced all your Feynman propagators by delta functions. And you know this guy, pi zero, is going to be a solution of your Pierre fuchs operator with a zero. It's going to be a proper, uh, pure period. So in a sense, I know, I know one period, and I will construct the Pierre fuchs operator. If I cut only two lines, I, I, I get the over period, the, the non-holomorphic one. So, Quantum field theory tells you what are the, 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 the period of your elliptic curve. The nice thing is that when you do, <laughs> when you do the expansion when p square is infinite, not, so the, naturally you want to do an expansion when p square is small. This is what physics wants normally. But actually, if you look at p square equal to infinity, it turns that this period is completely analytic and has the good taste for the, uh, for the banana family to involve the Aperi numbers. So, and the system has maximal unipotent monodromy for the scale of one. So essentially, we fit in the context of this paper by Yao, and I will comment about how we can extend their work at the end. But, but you know, from that period, it's, it's just trivial to just derive the picard fuchs operator. I mean, you, you, you have either the recurrence on the coefficient, and then you, you find the second order the second order differential operator. So now wha what happens is that if now you do it for, <laughs> I'm sorry, if you do it for higher loops, you get, you get a sum with more integers, yeah? so you have the generalized Aperi, and again, you build the, the picard fuchs operator using standard methods, uh, just looking at the differential equation associated to a series expansion that you know very well. So now I have constructed my picard fuchs operator, and it acts on my integral. So by generic statement, the action of the picard fuchs operator on my uh, form is not zero, it's exact. But, so that means I can use, I can integrate by part, but because of the problem I mentioned before that my domain of integration is not in the homology, I get a boundary term and this is what gives me the inhomogeneous term. The inhomogeneous term has to do with the extension of the Hodge structure and instead of going into explicit construction of this, I, I want to tell you actually physically how you can understand this for this class of graph. This inhomogeneous term has two pieces, y and some piece that is in a log in the masses here. The y part is easy, because actually when you think about this system, it's a, it's a simple d-module, 
And the Y piece actually comes from the Gauss Manning connection. It immediately gives you the, the Yukawa coupling for the elliptic curve, which is exactly, you, you take the, the form, actually the residue. The, actually, I should have write here, yeah, I mean the residue form. I differentiate it with respect to my parameter. I wedge it, and I compute the integral over my elliptic curve. And that gives this. Another nice property of this system is that actually this Yukawa coupling is just the Bronskian. So it's just given to you from the Picard-Fuchs operator. Okay? If you want, this is constructing the connection, and Y is part of your, of your connection. The log terms are more complicated because they, they have to do with the extension. But still, if you think geometrically, in fact, that, okay, so what you have, the geometry of your graph, it's a field theory graph, but nevertheless, it has an elliptic curve. You have an elliptic curve, that means you have a torus, and it has punctures. So when you have a torus with punctures, what is very natural is to look at the integral of your uh, form between, I mean, on divisors. So essentially, all the, all the guys that come in are actually obtained by computing uh, this, the integral of the form between the, the puncture that you have on your elliptic curve and the punctures are given explicitly in terms of the mass and, and, and the p square that is given to you by physics. And by construction, this object, actually the, the new i give you the ci's, yeah, they are just uh, rational functions. So now we are, we are almost done. So in a sense, I mean, I have constructed the, the differential operator just by essentially understanding the geometry. And I can do it, if you want, at higher loop. But uh, now, once you have the differential operator, you can try to solve it, right? Okay, well, what you do is that actually, as I told you, I mean, my, 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 my integral is going to be a period of my motives. With one. So, in a sense, what we essentially, what you have to prove actually is that actually your sunset integral is a regulator period associated with your motive. And this is for all the families of bananas, where all the fun knows this is the case. So, essentially, what you have to do is that you know that your integral divided by your period of your elliptic curve is essentially going to be your regulator. And everything is fine, the, the symbol is tame, and so you are very happy. So one way to, to, to compute the regulator, instead of going to abstract math, I want to tell you a very, very intuitive and physics way to do it, is to have a representation of the coordinate on your cubic in terms of something that is very natural when, when you come from string theory, propagators, <laughs> theta functions. So these theta functions have the property of, you know, P1, Q1 are, are the various points that are on my elliptic curve, and I'm just yeah, having a function that are the right poles and zeros on my elliptic, on, on my elliptic curve. And the theta function, the theta one function is this one, is the standard one. Now, this, the regulator is just the integral of the log of x over z dy. So, no, you see, if you integrate the log of theta x, okay. So I'm forgetting the piece, okay, uh, there, there is a constant piece that doesn't depend on x, but you do here you know, the series expansion of these guys. So the series expansion of these guys give you the li1, the polylogarith, I mean, the log, which you integrate over the measure that is dx over x, and that gives you exactly li2. So this is the way you find that actually your sunset integral and the regulator is given by this elliptic d log evaluated at the various punctures on your uh, elliptic curve. And it takes exactly that form. So I like that form because it's explicitly convergent because I'm only summing over positive ends. You can use the functional equation of the dialog to write it as a sum over all, all n, positive and negative. And, and then you can get uh, an expression that is close to the one used by Braun and Levin, but then you need a regulator to, ex you need to regulate it to explain what happens when n is negative. So this one is perfectly convergent, it's the one that comes from the computation. So now let me go to the, 
free loop banana, so the free loop um, uh, amplitude. So the free loop amplitude, then I'm going to have uh, one more variable, and the degree is going to increase by one. Okay. So now, what the graph, the graph polynomial, is this. So when all the masses are the same, I'm sorry. So the statement here is when the, all the masses are the same. Okay. When the, all the masses, in the general case, that when t varies. This is a family of K3 surfaces. But when all the masses are the same, this is a very special K3. It is uh, this uh, K3 that is actually is obtained by the same product of the elliptic curve I described before. And this was already studied in the past by uh, Elena Veril. And, by, uh, and you can derive the Picard Fuchs operator by just looking at the, the period, the period that I described to you. So you just have the, the, the period, then you have the Aperi number for the K3 problem, and then bingo, you, you, you get it in the, so I write it for all the equal mass case. Now, in the all equal mass case, the regulator, so you have to look at the K3 of the K3, yes, sometimes you, so this is so complicated that sometimes you want to make stupid jokes. Um, that it's essentially given by, so essentially you want to think that this three loop guy is one more integration on the top of the two loop guy. So I had Li2, an elliptic Li2, so one more integration will give me an elliptic Li3. And this is indeed what you find. So you find this is the elliptic free log. And this is exactly on the nose the, the one that was considered in these references. So in a sense, I mean, this setup of this banana graph is exactly a case where the Feynman integral is a regulator. So, of course, this regulator has a special property of being a multivalued function. So in particular, all these objects, when you do a modular transform on Q, they are not invariant. But when you change Q, you change the value of the energy P square. So that means you explore in the, in the complex energy plane how the integral behaves, and then you will have to, to look at the branch cut and the monodromies. So it's very natural. In a sense, I mean, we described that in the paper. We show that how the, the, the modular transformation is exactly compatible with you, what you expect from unitarity and, and the monodromies of the function you want. Okay, so no, in a sense, I mean, here yeah, what I have in that description is something that is uh, essentially using, um, okay, so let me just go back. So the Q here, that, uh, the, the Q here that I have has to do with the complex structure of the torus because I have uh, explained, I'm sorry, yeah? So this is how I define my elliptic curve. It's C star divided by QZ, right? So Q is exponential to i pi tau, and, and, and the tau is the, the period ratio. And this is an expansion that is nice and good when you want to study your, 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 your integral when actually the value of the momentum, k square, is small. So now I'm going to, to do another expansion. I'm going to look at the expansion when k square or p square is infinite. So I told you that actually this is a good place because normally this is where my period, uh, that I call pi zero, where I had this very nice analytic structure and my system had maximal unipotent monodromy. And I could construct all my period using Frobenius method. So what, what, if you do that, and you realize that actually the expansion near P square equal infinity is better organized this way. So you, what you have is that you have here parameters, the mass parameters come here, and you have the exponential of r0 to the power l. L is the sum of three integers that are uh, defined here. And r0, so if you want, uh, the derivative of r0 is this analytic period I described, or another way to characterize what is r0 is to say this is the logarithmic Mellor measure. So this is the same domain of integration as pi zero, and pi zero was this integral when I have one over phi, 
This one is just the log of phi, okay? So people have already studied that, that kind of object in, in, in mathematics, but I know the exponential of R0 comes actually at your Keller parameter. So here I have three masses. So in a sense, if I put the mass with my R0, I have naturally three Keller parameters. So what you get here is that you get something that is your, your, your period times the log of your Keller parameter, so uh, cube, plus this sum here, and then you have numbers. You compute them, and you discover this. You discover that these numbers are actually rational numbers, and they exactly satisfy what you want for being a uh, genus zero degree D uh, number, and you can introduce the virtual, uh, virtual numbers here. So here yeah, I give a table. And actually, the, the way to extract these numbers, so there is a way to extract them just from, I mean, just with Mathematica from the graph. I mean, you, you, you don't have to think about something very complicated to do that. And, and if all the masses are the same, then you can even write a nice form for the, for the, for the mirror mark between your big Q, which is your Keller parameter, to your little Q, that is your uh, uh, complex parameter, which is this way. And then, yes, I'm going to come to it. And then you have this. So first, I mean, uh, that was discovered by accident. But then, of course, we, underst we understood why. So essentially, what's happening is that <laughs> the mirror symmetry of an elliptic curve is not, this is not a mirror symmetry, the, this Gromov-Witten invariant are not associated with the mirror symmetry of the elliptic curve. Yes. So what you have to do is that you have to, and, and this is true for all these banana families, you have to construct a non-compact non Calabio. So essentially, you construct a local uh, freefall by this way, elliptic fibration, and then you use the fact that actually the, um, uh, the graph polynomial that you get from the sunset is a del pezzo surface, okay? And no, the non-trivial statement that we proved is that actually, okay, so the first part of my talk that has to be with the uh, motive that was the B-model language, so we used the fact that actually the Feynman integral is a regulator period in the motivic cohomology. Then this, we had to prove that why it is identified to the local gromov witten prepotential for the freefold. And so you had to, we had to look at what is the cohomology on the A model side. And in particular, I used some result by Iratani on the quantum cohomology, which actually is very difficult to understand, honestly, to me. But anyway, you can do it. So, and, but to give you a sense of what's happening is that, so what, what happens is that you have your Calabio um, freefall that is on the top. So as everybody knows from, from string theory, sorry, when you have a Calabio freefall, the natural ob there's a natural object, the Yukawa coupling that is given by this, but you, it's a third derivative. But when you go to this non-degenerated and you go to this, non, uh, to this limit, essentially you just keep the local the, the, the Yukawa coupling for your local uh, non-compact version of it, and this guy gives on the nose the Yukawa coupling that I've constructed in a very uh, elementary way in the first part of my talk. Now, the prepotential for Calabio free, and in particular for Del Pezzo, uh, for this uh, elliptically fibered Calabio free based on, on Del Pezzo, has been uh, explicitly computed, for example, by uh, Albrecht Klem. So there is a generic form that is given like that. This is the Keller class, and, and here you have all instant ensemble, okay? So then there is a map that the QI are exponential of TI, and as uh, Albrecht uh, explained to us a few weeks ago, uh, that came in time for that conference, that actually <laughs> he, uh, he, he worked out the identification of the parameters between uh, our parameters and his parameters. And if you take the formula that he gives in his paper, you just apply this mapping, you get exact, you can reproduce exactly what we have computed on the other side. So that's pretty remarkable. That's pretty remarkable because um, first, I mean, that still works for the, for the next one, which is the, the free banana that is based on the K3. 
everything is fine. So the, so the guy after that, the, the for loop, uh, sunset, uh, actually, this one is, um, is a bit more tricky. I mean, normally, everything should work, but this is more conjectural. So this one, there is a sun here, because everything is under control. Here, I'm sure it works, but still needs to, to, to be understood. For example, uh, the interesting thing that happens for the for loop one is that uh, uh, this graph polynomial defines a Calabio threefold, and, and, and then you can already see, even in the, when all the mass are the same, that you are not going to get an elliptic for log. Essentially, what you get when all the mass are the same, the, the model is a Bart Nieto uh, model, and, 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 and then you already see obstruction to get elliptic, poly, elliptic polylogs. And now, if you want to construct the, the differential operator and look at the structure at infinity, well, uh, you have to pay attention to the smoothness of your, uh, well, of your construction. And so normally, that was some kind of a requirement in the, in the work by Yao and his collaborator. But essentially, you can, you can forget about it, and, and it still works. The very difficult part when you go to higher loops, that means higher degrees of this uh, polynomial I described, is to really extend the construction of the motivic class and the regulator period. In a sense, you can. <laughs> the machine seems the machinery seems to work, but but then you have to check many things, in particular uh, the symbol, and and this is this is it's complicated to have a proof that will be valid to all orders in n. Although, by physics, using unitarity, I don't see any reason why the story should stop. So in a sense, what I'm saying is that um, by looking at this graph, I, I think that there is maybe a way to go over some of the difficulties that were actually uh, expressed in that paper for going to higher, higher degrees. Anyway. So essentially, this is the, the thing I wanted to, to tell you, is that um, as, as a physicist, I think it gives a very efficient way of deriving the differential equation that people are looking for. It is a completely uh, alternative way of constructing the, 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 the differential operator compared to the integration by part identity method. The integration by part identity method looks a bit more systematic, but it has the same problem. Uh, it, it has the problem that, OK, you, you can get a system a differential operator that you have to check if whether it is reducible or not. So it, it has some of the defect of the GZK model, the GZK approach. Um, the, the, the Dwork Griffiths way of constructing the, the differential operator is what we used so far. but I mean, at some point, I mean, uh, whether it's systematic, it still needs to be, uh, you know, depending on the complexity of, the, of your Feynman integral, that may not be the, the optimal way. So <coughs> the other thing is that uh, what Brothers has noticed is that for special values of the, the, the momentum P square and the masses, uh, this Feynman integral evaluates to value of L functions. And what we showed actually with Spencer and Matt is that actually when, P, when all the mass are the same and P square equal one, the, the, the graph polynomial is very symmetric. The period is not anymore a mixed period, it is a, is a pure period. And essentially proving the relations that Broadhurst has discovered to, I mean, to the order to which we could do was essentially proving the Lin conjectures that relate period to uh, value of L functions. So at, at, at two loop and three loop, the, the elliptic curve and the K3 case, that, that's kind of easy because, and this is what we did. So at higher loop orders, I mean, this is, this is as hard as that, but this is of great interest for understanding as well all these various conjectures that Broders has been put forward in the relation between quantum field theory and number theory. And, uh, and there is as well some, some nice connection, and, and I hope that will 
that sometime I will have to say something interesting about the relation to the work of uh, the gamma class by Goleshev and Zagier. But you see, I think that by physics intuition, you, 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 you can then approach very, very abstract math and, and, and get a very concrete way of trying to, to get around some of the, the obstruction that people will think you could get. And this is all I wanted to say. Thank you.